A team isn't a team without trust. Without trust, they're just a group of people who all share the same boss, a boss they probably don't trust either. Hey leader, David Burke is here, organizational psychologist and author of four best-selling books on helping leaders and teams do their best work ever. And in this episode, we're going to talk about how to build more trusting teams. Learning how to build trust at work is critical. If you're going to be successful as a leader, but even as an employee or just as a teammate, you're going to need to get people to trust you and you're going to have to trust other people. If you don't have trust, it's more difficult to communicate. It's more difficult to collaborate. It's more difficult to get the information that you need. It's more difficult to work with your peers, your teammates, and even your boss. And when teams lack trust, it is almost impossible to get them to that level of excellent performance that all teams are capable of, but most most teams don't hit. There's even personal benefits too. People who work for high trust organizations or high trust teams experience 50% greater performance and 75% less stress. And the inverse is also true. People who work for low trust organizations are less effective performers, but have a whole lot more stress. So having said this is important, let's go over four ways to build trusting teams. So the first way to build trusting teams is to signal vulnerability. This is especially important if you're in a, a leadership role, but even if you're just an influential teammate, one who people look at, it's important to signal vulnerability, to reveal some own vulnerability about yourself. Now, we're not talking about deal-breaking levels of vulnerability. We're not talking about how you never had a date for your high school prom or your parents never loved you. Or, you know, Those things are, yes, they're part of your life, but probably not a good idea to start with them. We're talking about smaller scale vulnerability, being willing to admit you made a mistake, saying, I don't know, and then soliciting ideas from the rest of the team. It, you know, it's always okay to not know the answer. It's not okay to not then look for the answer, but it's not only okay to not know the answer, it signals some level of vulnerability that you're willing to tell the team, look, I don't have all of the answers. What we know from the research on trust from people like Paul Zak and others is that Trust isn't given, trust isn't earned, trust is a reciprocal process. It starts with somebody trusting another person, stepping out in faith and trusting another person. That moment of faith is a moment of vulnerability. And we know, particularly from Paul Zach's research, that when people do that and they signal vulnerability, they're demonstrating that I trust you enough to say this. And when you're on the receiving end of that act of trust, you feel trusted and you're more likely to respond with trustworthy behavior. It kicks off the virtuous cycle of trust. When people are the opposite, when they're guarded, when they're protected, when they're running around with so much bravado that they're never actually vulnerable, trust can actually go the opposite way and become a vicious cycle of distrust. So get that cycle moving by signaling that vulnerability. Small scale, not deal-breaking levels of vulnerability, not embarrassing levels of vulnerability, but being willing to admit where you make mistakes, where you don't know the answers, owning the mistakes that you make, all of those can be ways that you signal that you trust the other person by being willing to trust them with your flaws. The second way to build trust on a team is to welcome task-focused conflict. I actually had welcome conflict here in the notes before I started recording this episode, but I need to specify we're talking about task-focused conflict person-based conflict, conflict of personalities, making fun of somebody for their, who they are or something like that, that's destructive to trust and destructive to an entire team. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking here about conflict of ideas, conflict over what's the right way to go about a specific task or a specific project. That type of conflict is okay. In fact, that type of conflict usually makes work better. And that type of conflict can be a trust-building activity too if you're teaching the team to to fight right when they fight over ideas. So for example, don't criticize the idea directly when you're fighting over ideas. Certainly don't criticize the person, we already covered that. But don't criticize the idea directly. Instead, think about the assumptions behind the idea. Are they assuming a certain amount of budget or a certain amount of time? Are they assuming that people have enough capacity to add this new idea that they have for the team to their task load? Ask questions about those assumptions in a way that's sort of welcoming critical thinking, not just pushing back and asserting that your idea is best. So you welcome task-focused conflict because it teaches people to fight right, and then those same people can be willing to trust the team with their even crazier ideas. I know this is super counterintuitive, but it turns out to be true. When teams know how to fight over ideas properly in a way that is respectful, you 
actually get the crazier, fringier ideas because people know they're not going to be personally put down, but actually that the team is going to get better ideas as a result of their freewheel wild ideas. So they trust the team with more of that and they continue to build on that virtuous cycle of trust even through conflict, as long as that conflict is task focused. The third way to build trusting teams is to celebrate failures. And this one's just as counterintuitive as the conflict one, I, I get it. But to celebrate failure, celebrate mistakes, not, not the failure in particular. You know, we're not celebrating the fact that someone is grossly incompetent, we've been ignoring it for months and they continue to fail. That's not what we're talking about. But screw ups happen, mistakes happen, recessions happen, global pandemics threaten the supply chain, force everyone to work in their uh, pajamas for 18 months. You know, th things like that happen. And when they happen, we need to have an honest conversation about what went wrong wrong. And we only have that honest conversation if people feel safe to discuss their role in it. So what we celebrate is the transparency that it takes to have a proper after action review. What we celebrate is people saying, my bad, you are not your mistakes. When you say my bad, you're not saying I'm bad, you are not your mistakes, but you're taking ownership of what you might have made a wrong assumption about or maybe committed a wrong action about and you're owning, fixing the problem as well, which earns even more respect and even more trust. So that's what we celebrate. Now, you could actually celebrate the whole failure. Right? I actually know of several organizations that have rituals. Uh, Sarah Blakely at Spanx calls them oops moments, where we actually say, hey, here is what happened and here's what I learned from it. Gary Ridge at WD-40 Company calls them learning moments. We don't make mistakes, we make learning moments. And so we celebrate the fact that people are extracting lessons from their failures. You could celebrate that directly, but at a minimum, celebrate the transparency that happens when your team is uh, digesting their failure, when they're breaking it down and trying to figure out how they're going to get better at it. Celebrate that level of transparency and you get more of it. And as you get more people admitting their mistakes, guess what you're getting? You're getting more people signaling vulnerability, so you're getting more of that cycle of trust. And the fourth way to build trusting teams is to establish help times. Help times, specific times in people's calendar that are reserved to helping another person on the team or, or even another team. I have to say, I, I sort of pilfered this idea from Google's famous 20% time where engineers are given 20% of their weekly calendar to work on any idea they want. But, but it's okay because Google pilfered it from 3M where it was 15% time. But I like help time. And what I like about help time here is that everybody should have time on their calendar that's set aside to offer help to a project someone else is working on. I think this does a couple of different things. I mean, the biggest is actually not related to trust. It's that it gives people a sense that you know, there's more than just you and your work in this organization. And they can see how their work Work fits into the larger whole. Uh, but it also gives people the ability to bring some outside ideas into that new project. So that's a second way benefit. But the one that relates to trust is that when you're on the receiving end of help, you, you recognize that you, know, you have to trust that person to accept their help and that they have to trust you. And you recognize that that person has good intentions at the end of the day. So much of organizational life, probably because it's a hierarchy, so much of organizational life, we think of our coworkers as our competition to get ahead. And establishing a regular ritual like help time where everybody says, you know, we're not actually competitors, we're all one big team and we're trying to work for the progression of all of these different projects establishing that makes people realize that you know I might I might one day be up against this same person for a promotion but I know them I like them I trust them and as a result I'm actually okay if they get the promotion too so help time has a myriad of different effects but the biggest one is trust because you can't be on the receiving end of help from someone else and not trust them. And you can't watch someone trust you and not feel trusted yourself. It doesn't have to be 20%, it doesn't have to be 15%, but establish a regular ritual of help time. Make it not okay for people on your team not to help each other. And while help time might be the most obvious and the least counterintuitive, it's not the one you start with. Because if you haven't started that cycle of trust, you're not going to get enough trust for people to accept the help and your help time experiment's gonna be a failure. There is actually no other place to start 
than number one, signaling vulnerability. And again, remember, it's not a deal breaker. It's just being willing to admit your own work-related flaws in front of your team, ones that don't undermine your leadership, but make them realize that you're willing to show them your whole self, warts and all, and as a result, they will feel more trusted. When that happens, they will show their whole selves to you as well, and the cycle kicks off. And then all of the other ones follow from that. Task-focused conflict gets better when the cycle's already kicked off. Celebrating failures is easier and more productive when the cycle kicks off. And help time is way more productive when the cycle kicks off. So start that cycle. If you're a leader, you've got to go first. Signal that vulnerability. Get started. Get started building that virtuous cycle of trust that will take everyone on your team to a place where they can do their best work ever. Oh, and one more thing. Most of this episode was about how to build trust on a team, but there are times where you inherit a team where people don't trust you, or there may be times where you did something where as a result, people don't trust you. And in that case, you're going to want to rebuild trust on a team. So you're gonna to check out this video here on how to rebuild trust on a team. I hope you don't have to rewatch it because you're not uh, diminishing trust over and over again, but you're definitely gonna to wanna to watch it once to know how to rebuild trust on teams.